Greetings class, thank you for joining me for this lecture entitled Sectionalism and Growing Disunion uh, for our introductory course in American History One. This lecture will really kind of bridge the gap from the early 1800s to the late 1800s from that uh, period of the first industrial revolution into the American Civil War. And so we start out here with this topic of sectionalism. And what that means is this kind of divide that is occurring in the nation among different lifestyles, social structures, customs, and political values between the North, the South, and the emerging American West. And so particularly between the North and the South, you have very different lifestyles, beliefs, and values that are largely shaped by this Industrial Revolution and the change that is occurring in the country at this time. And so in the North, you have uh, this this group that is reliant on industry, uh, a very large number of factory workers, a large population due to immigration. Uh, and you have at this point, free states that have outlawed slavery. And so a big part of this sectionalism is also this controversial issue of slavery that we're gonna see kind of lead us towards that American Civil War. And so you have that in the North. And then down in the South, you have a completely different economy, one that is reliant on agriculture and therefore also reliant on slave labor. And so you have rural populations where um, income is very different, uh, where many people are reliant upon slave labor to produce this output of agriculture in the South. And so these are slave states, states that wanted to maintain slavery and also wanted to see it expand westward as the nation continued to grow out to the Midwest. And so on, on, this, on these issues here, centering on the issue of slavery, a big part of that sectionalism divide is over this topic and primarily uh, feelings in the North and South on what needs to happen as the nation gains territory out West. And so a big part of that is uh, different pieces of slavery legislation. And so the first major one is the Missouri Compromise in 1820, proposed by Henry Clay to kind of ease the tensions between the North and the South over the Louisiana Territory. And so what it would do is it would prohibit slavery in the Louisiana Territory north of the 3630 parallel, except in the state of Missouri. So Missouri would then be added as a slave state, and Maine then would be added as a free state to kind of balance the, the free and slave states. And so you kind of have this early decision to try to negotiate and maintain peace or order by just balancing out the, the slave states and the, the free states. Fast forward a little bit and we get to 1846, we have a proposed bill called the Wilmot Proviso, which was a bill that would have outlawed slavery in any, any territory gained by the Mexican-American War. However, it failed to pass uh, in the Senate as, as pretty much states voted along their regional lines. And so you have the, the North voting, uh, one way, the South voting another, and, and this just increases that that sectionalism, that tension there that we start to see in the American political landscape. So as we get to the middle of the 1800s, we get to the Compromise of 1850, also proposed by Henry Clay following the failure of that first bill in the Wilmot Proviso. And this then admitted California as a free state, and then you had Texas as a slave state, and it took Utah and New Mexico and was going to allow them to decide the slavery issue through popular sovereignty. And what that would do then is it would allow the people of that area, the citizens of that territory, to decide the issue of slavery for themselves. Now, this is highly controversial at the time, but also because of a second part of this compromise, um, hence the name. You have the second part of this compromise of 1850 was the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, which said that all runaway slaves were to be captured and returned. Uh, there was harsh penalties for anyone who did not return runaway slaves, for anybody who helped a runaway slave. And then there was harsh penalties also for slaves for running away in the first place. And so here again, you had this attempt at compromise. Uh, but you also have this idea introduced of popular sovereignty, people of the area determining this issue for themselves. But that was a problem for many in the North and the South who had a certain sentiment uh, and belief on, on what the course of the nation should be moving forward. And they wanted to see this expanded uh, out West as well, their way of life continuing out into the West. 
And so, of course, it is it's a controversial topic, and we could debate if this uh, this you know ambition of compromise was a worthwhile goal, or if that should have been um, something that was strived for given the political landscape, or if you know if we have certain beliefs that we think you know slavery should have been abolished right away, or if there should have been uh, kind of this transitional period. Uh, that's certainly up for debate. But what what we see as a result of this is a a, a ever harshening divide. Um, and so one of the things that come along with that is violence. And that is going to play a big part of this whole uh, sectionalist divide. And, and it'll really ramp up this issue of slavery heading towards the Civil War. And so where this really begins is a after the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which created territories in, of course, Kansas and Nebraska, uh, and in order to open up new farmlands in the Midwest and begin this ambitious goal uh, and great project for the nation in the Transcontinental Railroad. Now, this immediately kind of, or quickly kind of repealed the Missouri Compromise and decided that the slavery issue altogether would just be settled through popular sovereignty. So again, the people of the area voting on the issue uh, and determining it, it for themselves. What this led to is a lot of people flooding to Kansas in an effort to have their voice heard on the issue of slavery and what would happen in determining the, the course of the nation's future out west. And so you end up with these pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces that clash in a very dramatic and violent way where you have uh, an abolitionist group led by a man by the name of John Brown against this uh pro-slavery soldier group from Missouri known as the Border Ruffians, where you have over 50 people killed. You have uh, John Brown committing uh, harsh, violent murders of people in their sleep. And, and this really creates fear around this issue and, and, and raises this level of anger and, and just ever steepens that, that divide between the, the North and the South on this issue of slavery. Violence wasn't just prevalent out in the public, though, it also occurred in the government sector. We actually had violence occur uh, in the United States Senate between uh, Charles Sumner and Preston Brooks, uh, where you actually have Brooks attacking Sumner uh, and knocking him to the floor at the United States Senate and beating him with his cane. And so we see this, this harsh level of violence occurring in the public sector, but also within the American government itself. Um, and people that are trying to determine uh, the best course for the nation moving forward. And violence, unfortunately, happens to be a big part of that. And so a big part of this issue of slavery uh, is, you know, what do you think these acts of violence did for that? What does that do? Well, uh, what, it, what it really did it, for many is it, it turned them off to negotiations on the issue. Uh, it, it, it just made people kind of further drift to the right or left on the issue um, and created this this harsh harsh divide in the nation uh, this sectionalism that we we now recognize and so we have uh, slave rebellions that pop up uh, things like Nat Turner's rebellion we have the return of John Brown and even more violence at at Harper's Ferry you have harsh decisions passed down uh, on people like Dred, Dred Scott who was a, a slave that was taken to uh, the free state uh, of Illinois, um, and his master wanted to uh, maintain uh, Scott as his slave, um, and but Scott wanted to buy his freedom, and so what ultimately happened was uh, he was refused, and there was a lawsuit uh, because he was being held a a slave in a free state, and ultimately the Supreme Court just came out and ruled that no, um, Dred Scott was not a citizen and as, as an African-American, and he had no uh, right to sue his owner in the first place. And so the government kind of takes this harsh stance, but then at the same time takes a kind of hands-off approach and, and gives this, grants this idea of popular sovereignty in the territories. And so what that lead, leads us to is to multiple positions on the issue of slavery. You have the abolitionist movement that thinks that slavery is, is evil and morally wrong and needs to be done away with immediately. You also have views that slavery is uh, a necessary evil, that that some slavery was wrong, but it was just necessary to maintain 
uh, Southern society, the way of life, the agricultural landscape. You even had people proposing ideas that slavery was a positive good, that, that argued that slavery improved the lives of slaves. You even get to this point where you have things like uh, the Bible and religion being used to justify slavery and at the same time being used to argue against it. And so that really leads us into this confusing landscape for many people in America where you have all this uncertainty, you have all this fear, you have anger, you have misunderstanding. Um, and this became a, a, a major tipping point for the nation. So as a result, we start to see a, a big change in the nation through multiple avenues. You have the rise of human rights movements, uh, the abolitionist movement that starts to call for the immediate unconditional total abolishment of slavery uh, in the United States. This is largely arguing against slavery on moral grounds, saying that it is simply morally wrong. And so you have uh, African Americans at the time, you have slaves of, of the time, you have uh, white Northerners uh, and others who are, are calling for this end of slavery and really help lead this abolitionist movement. You have a lot of other leaders such as William Lloyd Garrison, uh, Frederick Douglass, who are staunch abolitionists and really help start uh, and lead this, this movement. You have others like Sojourner Truth and, and Harriet Tubman who are calling for an end to slavery, who are bringing recognition to the, the trials of this issue and, and the problems associated with slavery. You have Tubman, who, who is, of course, famous for the Underground Railroad, who, due to the lack of abolishment of slavery, kind of takes matters into their own hand and begin to help through the Underground Railroad, uh, many slaves escape from the southern slave states up into the northern free states. Some hundreds of thousands uh, of slaves would escape during this time period uh, using the Underground Railroad. And so while you have this kind of call for human rights there, you also have this on the political landscape. The American political landscape is affected by this movement. You have the rise of the now very prominent Republican Party today, but it was just emerging in the 1850s as an anti-slavery party uh, going against the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. Um, and this is kind of frontlined um, by the early uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates where uh, D Douglas and Lincoln uh, ran off against each other. Um, and Lincoln doesn't yet win at this time, but gives his kind of famous speech known as the House Divided Speech, where he argues that this division between slave states and free states is not good for the nation, and, and it will not last. And he's very much correct in that manner. Um, of course, he will eventually go on to be elected president. He will be the one who does eventually end slavery. But what we start to see here is we see this push towards tremendous division. Um, you have the, this these movements that are occurring, you have violence that has been happening. Um, and once we get the election of Abraham Lincoln, you, you have this fear in the South that life as they knew it is over. Um, and you start to see the breakaway uh, from the Union in the South. And that will lead us into the American Civil War. And we will cover that much more in our next module. But a key aspect of this is going to be that this issue of slavery is going to play a big role in, in, in the Civil War, as, of course, slavery will eventually be abolished. Uh, but at the time, you have many soldiers signing up to fight in this war because of this issue. You have people um, wanting to end slavery and believing they are fighting for a morally justified cause. You have those who are fighting to preserve the institution of slavery because they believe that it is essential to their way of life and life as they knew it will disappear um, without it. Uh, and you have others who are um, potentially going to be freed if if slavery is abolished. And so they're ready to fight for that cause as well. And so you have this dramatic event, uh, one of the largest in American history that is going to unfold largely due to this controversial issue of slavery. And so we see its impact there. Um, and, and we see the way that that it starts to really affect and shape the, the nation in the kind of mid to late 1800s. Um, and we will ultimately see that played out as we discuss the Civil War in our next module. Thank you.